Okay. Hi. It's uh, nice to be here again on this side. Um, I, I'm going to be talking about uh, patterns. Right? And we, we know patterns in, in uh, programming are very important. But the usual patterns that uh, that we know are, well, mostly the, the such patterns as the Gang of Four book uh, describes, right? And they are based on some everyday objects, some familiar ideas, right? Smart pointer or facade or bridge. Um, I, I want to about something that's that's really much more abstract than that. And these are patterns in the same sense as, as the other ones are patterns, because that it's it's some structure that repeats itself in many places, and it can be um, some languages can be nicely abstracted. In other languages, can languages can be abstracted with some effort and pain, but still can be done. And these patterns actually are pretty useful. They have their basis in mathematics. And this is why they have names, such names as, uh, let me show you some of this, functor, applicative, monoid, monad. Okay, these are kind of weird names, but like bridge facade. So, um, so I'll be talking about these patterns. I will show you them in C++ mostly. Uh, I'll, I'll have a few uh, digressions into Haskell because Haskell has a very nice terse way of expressing things that in C++ <laughs> I will just have to do a lot of hand wave, right? So here I'm, I'm just going to fall back on Haskell for a moment uh, to explain certain things like current units. So, so these, this is the list of, of the patterns. Um, type constructor, functor, applicative, monoid, and monoid. And why am I doing all this? Not, not just for fun, although it's, it is fun. Um, but uh, what motivated me was uh, the um, effort to uh, abstract or write a library uh, that um, works with asynchronous API. Okay. So, so here, here's the problem. Create a library of, or a language extension, possibly, to C++, to encapsulate asynchronous API. And here's a little teaser. Okay, there is something called a combinator, where if you have, you know, if you are dealing with asynchronous calls, how do you combine them? You have two synchronous calls, asynchronous calls, right? Um, and you you want to combine them, uh, let's say, using the AND combinator. So what does AND combinator do? It returns result after both. The synchronous call is finished. No matter in what order they, it will wait for the last one. And once they are finished, they will combine their results in some way and return. It's sort of like wait for all. Okay? And there are many APIs that have these names. Uh, so this is how it's uh, implemented. Call the first one, wait for the result, then call the second one, and then combine results. Right? Or you can call both of them at the same time and, and then wait for it. Um, what's interesting about this, this is an interesting property, uh, that unless the functions have side effects, and of course in C++ we are used to side effects, um, in Haskell that's a no-no. Um, but when we are doing multi-threaded programming, in C++, or if we are doing a syn asynchronous programming in C++, it's a very good idea to avoid side effects, right? So these APIs should not do anything 
weird writing to our data structures or anything like that. They, they, they should just shoot, they should do their work and return a result. Okay? So if they don't have side effects, visible side effects, I mean, they can spin the disk and stuff like this, right? But they don't have these visible side effects. Then the result is deterministic, okay? And it's also independent on the order in which you start with these two, right? Because you have to wait for both of them to finish, so no matter what. Uh, now, a nice property of um, this end combinator is that you can check that. Right? I mean, you can imagine putting a bunch of ants on top of each other, right? And again, the result, if, if there's, there are no side effects, the result is always the same, no matter how you connect these ants. Right? So in fact, you can write something like, you know, symbolically, like A and B and C, where A and C are asynchronous dots. Um, now, um, in, so this, this is actually implemented in, in uh, some libraries, and it's implemented in C Sharp, and, but usually uh, they do this with uh, same type of values, right? And in fact, C Sharp returns this stuff in, in a vector. But it doesn't have to. It can be generalized so that you have multiple. Now, the OR combinator, very similar, sort of, you, you might think, right? I mean, so AND and OR, what's the difference? Uh, well, OR returns the first result that arrives. Sort of like wait for any, or selecting units. <coughs> How it's implemented? You have to start two calls in parallel. And here's the word parallel. When I'm, one of them returns, return its result and abandon the second. Okay? That's the implementation of this. And you can't do it without threads. Uh -huh. So that's already completely different uh, level of difficulty. Here you didn't need threads. And of course you have you have the uh, problem of um, garbage, right? This other thread, it will keep running even though you don't need it anymore. So do you kill it? We are not supposed <coughs> to kill threads. There's a ban on killing threads. So um, unless you have some protocol that the other thread occasionally checks for some token, so that's, a, that's another complication. And this thing can never be deterministic. Okay, so this is strictly non-deterministic. Unless, and there are situations like this, unless both of these calculations always return the same value, both of them the same value, depending on the inputs, depending on the state of the disk and so on, but uh, they just do some calculation in two different ways, but the result will be the same. Then it suddenly, miraculously, becomes deterministic. And of course, ORs can be chained as well. Right? If you have three ORs chained, and the first one with the fires will just kill all the other threads. But kill. <coughs> so there's a lot of questions about this seemingly simple problem, right? How similar are these two? And we see that there is like inherent dissimilarity between one and the other. And uh, is this some kind of algebra there? I mean, when you, you can, you, I mean, or and and, these are like multiplication, uh, like addition and multiplication, and you can kind of build polynomials out of it, right? You can say A times B uh, plus C, and so on. And of course there's this tiny question, how do, can the ends aggregate results uh, that, that is type, that, if they have different types? OK, 
Okay, and now I'm going back to basics. I will build this, the stuff up until we get to a level at which we can understand what is the deep, deep inherent difference between these uh, two combinators. And in the process, we will learn a bunch of very interesting and um, inno innovative in C++ um, patterns. They've been known in, in other functional languages forever. Okay, so what's a type constructor? Okay, it has a very precise meaning. It's something that, it's a recipe for creating new types from old types. Right? And there are several built-in type constructors in C++. You know, you, you take any type and you put a star in, uh, after it and you get a pointer to T. Right? So give me any type, star on it. Give you a pointer to this type. And this works also recursively, so if, if you give me the T star, uh, I can append star to it and I get T star star, and so on. Same with reference, an array also, type constructor, right? You have type T, you have array of T. Uh, function, that's an, that's an interesting one, okay? It's also a type constructor. Give me a type T, and I will give you a function that returns T. In fact, um, I can have a function that takes integer and returns T. That's another type constructor. I can have a pointer to function returning T, and so on. But then, so these were built in. Now using templates, you can create even more type constructors. You can, you can play with types more. So you have unique pointer of t, right? Give me any t, and, and and here when I'm saying any t, okay, do not interrupt me saying no, 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 you can't do it for this and this type. I know that, okay? I know. I know. <laughs> for any type in C plus plus is is almost always wrong, okay? Uh, so I have unique pointer, shared pointer. You have a vector of t. Uh, function, uh, that, that's a standard function, that's, that's it. Uh, function taking no argument, returning t. Can have a pair of t and u. Okay, so that's, that would be, oh, okay, so this, that would be a binary type constructor, right? It takes two types and creates a new type. Okay, so, oh, so if we have binary type constructors, then maybe we should call these unary type constructors, right? And Hey, we can have also nullary type constructors, right? This will be just built in types. Okay. Now, when you have a binary type constructor, you can just fill one of the uh, type arguments with a concrete type, right? And, and you'll get a unary type constructor, right? This is sort of similar to current. Uh, <coughs> um, and of course, function of t feet. That's another current type constructor. But there is a different way of looking at type constructors. You can look at them as uh, when you actually construct objects of, of this, this new type, right? They, they sort of hide a value. How do they hide a value? So, for, for instance, when you create a unique pointer of, of some type, I'm, I'm just putting T here because, but, but it should be of some concrete type, right? Um, then it hides a value of this type, right? And how do I get uh, access to this value? Well, I can do star P because operator star is overloaded. I can call the get method of P, right? Um, Vector, it also hides, right? It hides, but not one value of type v, t. It can hold arbitrary many values, all of them you know, of the same type. And how do I access these values? Oh, either by indexing or by iterators. 
And, and then function, okay. Function, that's an interesting. Uh, how is function hiding a value? Right? Well, if you are operating with functions with no side effects, they have this referential transpa transparency property that if you call them with the same arguments over and over again, you'll always get the same result, <coughs> right? So you might as well say, you know, this function contains values of this type and I access them by sort of indexing, by providing an argument and it gives me a result, right? I can implement a function as, as a table if I want, right? Some simple functions can be done like that. Okay, so there's a huge, huge number of, of these type constructors that hide values in very creative ways. So that was the first pattern. Second pattern is a functor. And a functor is a way, uh, adds a way of acting on these hidden values. Right? By acting, I mean applying function. So let's see how this can be implemented for a unique point. I, mean, I could do all, the li all, all this list and implement stuff uh, for, for you know, vector, tree, and so on. But let's just go over unique pointer. So, and, and, and let's concentrate just on, on one thing. I want to apply length to the inside of a unique point. So I have a string, but I don't have it directly. I have it inside a unique point, right? And I want to imply it, apply it. Of course, one way of, way of doing this is this traditional, you know, int len equals minus one. And then if p, which looks inside the, the Unique um, pointer and finds out whether there is something or nothing, right? So if p, then length equals length of p dot get. So I get the insides of p because now I know that p is not empty. I get the insides I apply the function. So I have a way of taking a function and sneaking it under. Uh, the um, unique pointer, but it's not general enough, right? It's clever, but not general enough. So here's a, a more general way of doing this. Okay, since I don't like this minus one as a special value, right? I mean, in this case, we know that negative length lengths are impossible, but maybe in some other universe you have negative length strings and so on, right? So, I want to signify somehow, return a value which is enriched in a way by saying, okay, this has length or it doesn't have length, a length. So my result would be meaningless, because it doesn't. So we can do it by also returning from it something encapsulated in the unique pointer, which has this property that could be empty, right? So let's say I say unique pointer of int length. And now if p, and, and notice that the default initializer will just put a null in, inside it, right? So good. If p, so if there is something, then I can do this p get, get the inside of p, apply, apply length, and then create a new int with this length and then assign it to my result. Right? <coughs> so now I have a way of getting inside a unique pointer and return a unique, uh, unique pointer of an integer. Okay, so is this general enough? Can it be generalized? Of course, easily. <clears throat> but let's go a little bit further with abstracting it so that the generalization is as abstract as possible. Um, so we, we will call this operation lifting. We take a function and we lift it. So let's lift length. 
So lift, lifted length is a new function that has the following property. It takes a unique pointer of string and produces a unique pointer of integer with the usual properties of uh, you know, calculating the length if possible. Um, so let's see something like this, lifted length. That that would be a function that takes a unique pointer and it does just this code that I showed you. So result, if p, then sign, return result. That takes unique pointer of string, takes unique pointer of int. Length, we're taking <coughs> string and returning int. Now this new lifted length does almost the same, but encapsulates the results, yes? Is p a global? Is p a global? Should have been should. Yeah. Oh, the S. It should be S. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, I was changing names. Always oh, happens in, in slides, right? <laughs> you say, oh, man, this is, this is a string. It has to be S. But you leave P in one place. <laughs> I mean, all, all this stuff actually works. Um, I mean, I implemented all this stuff. Uh, but sometimes when you copy, you know, try to make it nicer. So, so why is it called lifting? Because you have this, this image. So I'll be operating with imagery a lot here. Okay, so you, this image, you have a string and length produces an integer. But when you lift it here, string is lifted to unique pointer of string. Int is lifted to unique pointer of int. And here, high above the crowds, you know, lifted length takes this. Yes. But why, why length? Right? I mean, obviously, this can be applied to any function. Any function of any argument and any, any, uh, any single uh, argument function, right? So we have a function f. How do we lift it? Well, lifted f, if f takes a and returns b, a and b are types, right? Then we then lifted f will operate on unique pointer of a and will produce unique pointer of b. And here's the definition, okay? It's parameterized by a, a and b, obviously, right? And that's exactly the same as before, except that here you see f. And there is no s here, this is all p. Okay? So again, this picture, now it's uh, even more abstract. Type A, type B, function from A to B, lift, lift to death. What's the beauty of the beauty of it is that we don't really once we def define this this mapping, right? Which I call F map, by the way, and this is the official way of calling this kind of mapping. Um, you don't have to look inside of the unique pointer anymore. If you, all you want to do is apply a function to to its to its insides, right? And, and you can chain them. Also, no problem. You see, if if the first one, for instance, contains a null, and then then this this null in, in the unique pointer will be propagated all over. No functions will be called because there's always this checking, right? So if you if you have, for instance, trim the uh, the string, string and then calculate its length, you know, you can lift it. You have lifted trim, lifted length, and it goes through the same. Sorry, on the last slide, what is move? <laughs> <laughs> move, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, because. Unique like, pointer has more faces than one. Okay, I'm sort of using the unique pointer here, and, and I'll be talking about this more of like a maybe uh, in, in Haskell. Um, but it also has this property of being a unique owner of something. So it doesn't really have a copy constructor. You cannot copy these things. You have to move them. Okay. So what does 
just because you are talking about that, then after calling the function, P is not pointing anymore to the screen height, right? Yeah. So it's not returned to the original owner after the function finishes. No, the original could, could, owner could loses see, ownership. Could we see the previous slide for five seconds? Would be a more useful function if there were an ampersand after unique pointer mm -hmm. A. If, if it were a reference. So that it Let's not go there. Let's not <laughs> go there. You are trying to use a unique pointer for a purpose that's not supposed to be used. Okay, unique pointer has unique ownership. And passing it by reference and doing something to it. Okay, no, you're so right. This does Const, have side re effect. Const reference. Yes? Const reference. Const reference. Excellent. Yes. yes. Const reference. Const reference. Okay. So, but this has a side effect that P is destroyed when you call I know. this thing. I know. So let's let's think of this as a <laughs> const reference. Right? Okay, const reference. Can we concatenate the two screens? <laughs> At some point, yes, we'll, we'll talk about concatenation. <coughs> um, so, okay, composition, and uh, here's another example of how to lift a function to a vector type, right? So we have a function operating on values, and now we have a vector, and, uh, and you want to operate on this vector without actually going inside. So, um, so you can define this F map also for vectors easily. The, the interesting thing about it is very similar to the other one, except that there's no checking for empty vector because that's not necessary. Um, that we are using transform, and transform is, is uh, really an F map already, sort of. I mean, it's, it has different, you know, because it takes uh, these uh, uh, iterators, right? But, but it really does the same thing, right? So I'm just calling one F map from another F map. So is transform part of the uh, STL? Yes, yes. So maybe it, maybe it shouldn't be underscored, maybe it should be bolded or something. No, this is actual transform. Yeah, yeah. STD transform. That's what I'm calling. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Again, you would want to make this a const reference to AS, otherwise you copy it on the way in. Yeah. I don't care about such little details. <laughs> it makes too long. Of course, when, when, when I get to the optimization phase of this, then I will do that. But sometimes it's just, you know, for the sake of progress, you uh, don't care about certain details. 